Good morning. Good morning. Good to see all of you join us for worship and praise on another day that God has given us to live as his children. When I was serving in the parish for most of my ministry, we would observe Life Sunday. There was a Sanctity of Life Sunday on the Sunday that was closest to the anniversary of that infamous Roe v. Wade decision that legalized abortion. And so I'm going to, my message today is going to be a message of just how much God treasures life and how life is a gift from God. And it's under the theme, Life Under the Cross. So that's the focus in our service today. As we begin, before we begin the service itself, in preparation for the Winter Texas Banquet and the kickoff of the funding campaign that's going to be held at the end of this month, each week we're having someone share a faith story. And today, Gunter is going to share his faith story with us. So come on up. Good morning. Uh, my story is a little long. So, so I skipped a whole bunch of stuff, <laughs> and I just summarized it. And uh, all I can say, God is patient, and God is loving. Other than that, I don't think I would be standing in front of you. I was born in 1935 in Berlin, Germany. For the first five years of my life, was pretty normal. Uh, then the war started, and from then on it was upheaval after upheaval, and I moved around eight times by the time I was 12, between Berlin, the Baltic Sea, France in various places, and in Germany, uh, in the Alps and stuff like that. And so it, I had a very illustrious upbringing, but I was a kid. Everybody else was in the same boat, and you just went with whatever happened. And your parent, my parents fortunately moved ahead of any destruction, which was, we had a lot of bombings. And I mean, I, I, one, one time I really feared for my life because of it. But it, it, you know, in short, these were the experience of a young kid, not just me, but a whole bunch of people, or young people. And therefore my schooling was interrupted I was in eight different schools in eight years, all over, you know, in different places, France, Germany, and so on. And that does not make for a stellar student, believe me, <laughs> especially when you spend months not having school or you're in the bunkers while you have school. So this is my excuse. And my dad, <laughs> my dad, and so I, you know, I, I basically had an eighth grade up education and, I, and that is stretching it, okay, because I forced my dad to take me out of school. I was in high school, I flunked the first grade, so I repeated it and I succeeded. Then we moved again and I was there and I realized I was way over my head. Math was definitely a killer for me. Everything else was mediocre before, you know, okay. But uh, I didn't have a, a, a dad that understood that. He wanted me to be, of course, better than him, and that, that was definitely out of the question. So because of that, I decided I was not going to do anything in school anymore, and I wanted to get out, and I forced my dad, and the, the teacher finally called him and explained to him, okay, he has a mandatory time behind him. You can take him out and let him do what he wants to do. Okay, I, want, I went into horticulture because I had a neighbor girl that told me her uncle had two greenhouses and, and one of them I spent about uh, two weeks in the, in the Easter time and after that I decided not to do anything more in school until my dad would take me out and that's what happened eventually. So, uh, there is hope however and faith was not part of my life for the first 25 years. Keep in mind, this was a Hitler time. Uh, you did not unless you lived somewhere in the Alps in a, you know, ski resort or so, that was different. They were usually Catholic people and they were very loyal to, to go to church. I had basically no church for 25 years. I knew a little bit about it. And a few times I came home after I was an apprentice for three years, my dad started going to church 
And I came home maybe every five, six weeks, and we went to church, and after church he asked me to tell him what the pastor said. Uh, okay, I was not interested in church anymore. So this is where I came from. Okay, to make it short, at 25 years of age, I came to the United States. I always wanted to, I didn't know why, but I idealized it. The family I lived with drove to church every Sunday over here in Navarro, Ohio. Mr. Keller, who is my boss, and I lived with him in the family, very nice family, he sang in the choir, so I became part of that choir. There was never any question. I didn't even know English. I mean, a little high school English. And uh, I know I had a lot of trouble with the taram tam tam and the little tremor boy a half a year later. <laughs> and we had a very strict choir director, not as nice as what we have here. So, <laughs> on the way to church, we listened to the radio sermons, and I, I enjoyed them very much. And the, the kids, four of them, were arguing with dad because Ephesians something there where it talks about the you know, parents be nice to your kids and all that. <laughs> they, they were discussing that one, uh, not in a very nice way. <laughs> uh, uh, after I met Molly, so this is my wife, she's over there. Uh, she, was a, uh, she came up about a month and a half before I did. We didn't know each other. And, uh, uh, but after I met her, we uh, make a long story short, actually, uh, again, uh, we decided to get married. Uh, we both were believers at that time because the same thing happened to her. She ended up in the choir the first Sunday. She was here because a neighbor girl went there and her, wherever she lived, he said, you know, you want to go with her? And, and so she was in the choir, I guess. It was a Presbyterian or Methodist church or so. And so we both were accustomed to being in the choir. And we both were believers. We had very little money, as you can imagine. I made 65 bucks a month on room and board uh, when I started. And uh, by the time I met her, I think I made $100. And, you know, uh, she made more money than I, and that's why I married up. <laughs> and then later on, I realized that uh, actually I really married up because she was much better educated than I was. So uh, that it kind of works, you know. I might be the more practical guy, and she is the more cerebral person and uh, has a lot of common sense. And uh, I'm sure that helped me a lot, too, because I was very enthusiastic, gung-ho, doing almost anything. I moved around at, at Will for about five, six years after I uh, became a journeyman. And uh, basically, uh, just decided where I wanted to go, and if I liked it, I stayed. If not, I moved on to something else. And uh, finally, uh, uh, you know, I, 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 I didn't think about a wedding because we couldn't afford it. But the Kellers decided for us to have a church wedding and a reception at their house, which was very nice of them because they were highly interested in having me forever. <laughs> so I remember promising God in my mind that we will stay married, come what may. And it's almost 60 years, and we're as happy as we ever were. There are some challenges sometimes, but the underlying love and for us that we had at the beginning is still there. And we, we have a lot of fun together in life. We've, we have gone through a lot of stuff, maybe more because of my uh, tempestuous enthusiasm, but <laughs> she is the, the, you know, the, the person that is rational, has uh, basically strengthened my faith. So we were never quite, let's see here, but, so yet 60 years on, on the 10th of February, okay? You want to celebrate that? <laughs> we're going to be here. <laughs> we're, we're in quite a, we were in quite a few Lutheran churches because uh, I, I moved around professionally a lot. Opportunity or otherwise, I, I, I was going after it. And so there were a lot of transfers and job, job changes. And church, church became a, a way of life all the time. 
Uh, spiritual growth was followed automatically, basically. You can't help when you're surrounded by believers and with them all the time. Your friends become, you know, come out of that group. Uh, it straightens out your life a lot in a hurry. So in California, we joined uh, Christ the King Lutheran Church. Pastor Carlson, a very famous pastor eventually, uh, he was just dynamic. And he preached off the cup. He would just walk off there and talk, and I mean, it was spellbinding. Old Testament, New Testament, he's got, he, he, uh, he was a pro, that's all I can say. And I enjoyed it very much. Uh, we joined the choir there too, because they discovered our latent talent in singing. Which is, <laughs> Uh, I, I actually tried to say, you know, I'm not that good, but uh, I guess I, I made it all the way. So, uh, and it, that was, a, a, by the way, a choir director very similar to what we had. He had humor, he had understanding, he knew how to do it, and he would move right next to me and sing, and of course I sing wonderful after that. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, we have three children. They're all loyal to us. And we brought them up. Uh, and I would say my wife had more to do with that than me. But in terms of, you know, bringing them up properly. And, and what, which she did a lot more. I, she's more consequential than I am. I might admonish you, but also understand that I wasn't that perfect either, you know. So uh, by now I understood that a spiritual life will have impact on how you go through life. That became event eventually apparent. And what oh, the underlying thing of all of this is that it, it was a very gradual thing that I came to be the way I believe now. And, and so we're not instant believers. Life will teach us that. So our children participate in Christian education and activities. My thinking was that I was probably not able to give them a deeper understanding of faith other than the examples we set. And I am a believer in examples. And example is personal as well as, you know, when, when you do something, do it exemplary. Do it above the board. Don't just, you know, get by. There came a time or times of stress job frustrations, real estate delays, in short, very trying times. Believe me, I had them. And uh, this is just a quick summation, su summation of that. We continued our church life and giving, even under the harshest circumstances that we encountered. God was watching over us no matter what, whether we knew it or not. And there's a purpose in life, spiritual growth being the most important, which I found out a little later in life. I became more humble through these time periods. And they were periods, not just one. And that means I adjusted my life somewhat. We had faced Mali's especially. I'm a believer. And when, excuse me, when things got tough, she was rock solid, and she calmed my fears. After ten years of working, uh, of being, uh, of ten years of work, I mean, I've been in my profession for forty-five years, I guess, something like that. After ten years of work, being in charge of. My company, I was fired at the height of my professional accomplishments. I mean, I was it. I was actually somewhat well known in California because of my, what I did. The older son of my employer took over as a complete outsider. But I was, it was told us in many of these top meetings that we had all over the country, blood was thicker than water. Meaning there were four brothers that owned these operations that we had. And uh, all we managers and growers and whatever we were, uh, we were water. And that meant you could be fl flying out of there in a hurry if necessary. And so this guy had flunked a few operations 
And because of that, there was no place to go, so they took him back to the headquarters. And that's why I got kicked out. I was supposedly not good, but I got a $6,000 bonus and produced more than ever on Valentine's Day. All of that didn't matter. So uh, their, their experience, this experience was the toughest for me personally. And that's where my wife came in, in terms of encouraging, having faith, and uh, you know, building me up when I was desperate. I was not resentful though, and asked God to forgive them. At the same time, I was on my knees regarding my future. And I remember praying for my dad, who had a lot to do with me being unhappy. But I prayed for him, I forgave him, and I asked God to forgive me. So, Molly's was encouraging and supportive. She had faith. I was very worried. So, for a while I felt humbled, but I recouped when I realized that God needed me to be more responsible and thankful. Because, you know, everything kind of went pretty well most of the time, but finally I hit the wall. Looking back at our almost 60 years of marriage, we can see clearly that perceived challenges meant spiritual growth. New opportunities, guidance of our lives because of it. So cancer, we both had it. And we both went through it. it I was prepared to meet my maker almost joyfully when I was on the operating table. And I felt sorry for all those that were part of my life. God allowed both of us to pull through and be as healthy as can be. I always wanted to be there for our grandson Jason, six foot four. He has autism and he needs all the help they can get. He's a wonderful young man and he is a lot at our house and I had dedicated my life to be part of his life as much as I can be to help him and also our daughter. So in summary, hope, love, joy, we are at peace. Come what may. It says over, let's see if there's no, oh, that's it. All right. <laughs>
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God. Therefore, repent and live. Almighty and merciful God, we confess that we stand guilty before you. We stand in violation of your law, rebellious and disobedient against your words and ways. We stand under judgment, deserving of punishment, present and everlasting. We have stood silent and inactive towards sin and Satan. We have stood angry and accusing toward you and each other. We have stood heedless of our neighbor's safety, survival, and salvation. We have stood determining life's worth by what works one has done or cannot do. We have stood dead in trespasses from conception and enslaved by sinfulness unto death. Here we stand in need of your forgiveness and grace. God, help us repent and believe and live by your Son's incarnation, sacrifice, and arising as our Savior. Amen. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has come and intercedes that you may have life. His eternal servanthood announces and defends the preciousness of every human being. He has suffered as your substitute, shed his blood for all, risen from the dead, and sent his spirit to enact and extend the many blessings of abundant and everlasting life. Because of his passion, by his presence, ordained and authorized with his power, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We read responsibly a portion of Psalm 103. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. And passes over it, and it is gone. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy. You may be seated.
Almighty God, you know we live in the midst of so many dangers that in our frailty we cannot stand upright. Grant strength and protection to support us in all dangers and carry us through all temptations. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from Nehemiah chapter 8. All the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate, and they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the books of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the word of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way. Eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. This is the word of the Lord. Our New Testament reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. But the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greatest honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ, 
and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with the tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts. This is the word of the Lord. sinner lost and left to die oh, raise your head for love is passing by come to Jesus come to Jesus come to Jesus and live now your burdens lifted and carried far away and precious blood has washed away the stain Sing to Jesus, sing to Jesus, sing to Jesus, and live. And like a newborn baby, don't be afraid to crawl. And remember when you walk, sometimes we fall. So fall on Jesus, fall on Jesus, fall on Jesus. Us and live. Sometimes the way is lonely and steep and filled with pain. So if your sky is dark and pours the rain, cry to Jesus, cry to Jesus, cry to Jesus. And when the love spills over and music fills the night And when you can't contain your joy inside Dance for Jesus, dance for Jesus, dance for Jesus And live And with your final heartbeat Kiss this world goodbye, then go in peace and laugh on glory's side. Fly to Jesus, fly to Jesus, fly to Jesus, and live. Fly to Jesus, fly to Jesus. Fly to Jesus and live. We rise for reading the gospel. Holy Gospel according to Luke, the fourth chapter, beginning at verse 16. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. 
And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up for three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise and we speak our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.
grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God the Father, from our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, your Christian friends. The basis for this morning's message is Romans chapter 12, verse 12, which says, Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. A few weeks ago, I was visiting my wife's parents and saw that picture hanging over their kitchen table. Cheryl and her siblings gave that picture to her father a little over 20 years ago. It depicts Jesus as a small boy in the carpenter shop of his father, Joseph. You can see the tools and Joseph at work on the bench there. And Jesus is there in the center facing a window. The sun streaming through that window shines on Jesus in such a way that it casts a shadow. And if you look, you can see that that shadow is in the shape of a cross. Also, I'm not sure you can make it out, but in his hand, he's holding a nail. The kind of nail that we envision was probably used to go through his hands and his feet as he was crucified on the cross. That image for me has always been powerful in the theological truth that it shares. Even as a small child, the cross was a part of Jesus' life, who he was. Christ our Savior was born to die. He was born to die so that by his death he might destroy death and death's power once and for all. He lived his entire life here on earth under the shadow of the cross. The cross was his goal. The cross was his aim. The cross was his destiny. The cross was the means of his victory over sin and death and the power of the devil. And like the Lord whose name we are privileged to bear, Christians live life under the cross. For us, life under the cross is a submission to the will of God and trusting in his promises. Life under the cross is a life lived not on the basis of things as they appear to be or even as the world perceives things to be. Life under the cross is living life understanding the way things really are. Life under the cross sees everything from the perspective of Jesus Christ, crucified and risen again. Knowing that God sent his only son to die in humiliation and pain on a cross for you helps you to see everything from the perspective of Jesus Christ. And that changes everything. The cross is God's repudiation of everything the world values and cherishes. What the world sees as weakness the cross reveals his strength. What the world rejects as foolishness, the cross shows to be the wisdom of God. That's what Paul was writing about to those who were preoccupied with worldly things. In 1 Corinthians 1, he said, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. We preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. That insight was at the heart of Luther's theology. He distinguished between what he called a theology of glory and a theology of the cross. The theology of glory is the mistaken understanding that focuses on man and his expectations. The theology of glory delights in power and success and size and pleasure. Many of the so-called prosperity preachers that are popular in this country are all about a theology of glory, preaching a message that people want to hear, even if it's not accurate or biblical. A typical proclamation of a theology of glory would be to say, well, if you just have enough faith, 
you won't have any problems here on earth. And that's not what God says in his word, not by a long shot. On the other hand, the theology of the cross, the proper message of scripture, focuses on God. The God who reveals himself to us in the suffering and death of his son on a cross. The theology of the cross points us to the satisfaction that Jesus made for our sins on that cross. The theology of the cross clings to the promises that God has made, even in the midst of our personal suffering and pain. To live by the theology of the cross is to be content with God's promises in the face of everyday struggles and trials in life. Because that's living under the cross. The difference between the way of the world and the way of the cross is clearly seen in life and death issues. As Christians, we stand for life in a culture that is obsessed with death. Sinful human beings are fascinated by death. Oh sure, we fear it. We deny it. We live our lives as though we're going to be here forever. But still, death intrigues us and it fascinates us. It's glorified in movies and television programs. And the world keeps looking to death for the solution to its problems. They look to death as a means of escape from responsibilities. By that, I mean, you, you've probably had either thought yourself or know of someone who said something along these lines. Well, I wish he were dead, then I wouldn't have to deal with him anymore. Death is a solution. But that's just a thought, right? Or is it? When a young man who's been bullied by his classmates decides to take an automatic weapon to school with him and then opens fire, trying to use death as a solution to his problems. We wonder how it got so bad. The answer is the mori mores, the morals of our society. With ever increasing frequency, our society chooses death as its alternative. Death for the unborn. Death for the old and the infirm. Death for the sick. Death for those suffering. Death for the handicapped. Death for all those who fail to meet a certain standard of quality as presented, as, as presently defined by the world. If life doesn't meet a certain standard that they think it should, then it's disposable. Get rid of it. Well, sure, they make attempts to cloak all of this in some nicer terms that have been provided to them by the father of all lies, the devil. They'll speak of freedom of choice, death with dignity, a kind or merciful death, which is another way of saying euthanasia. But behind all these sweet-sounding, gentle words lurks an ugly reality. It's still death. That's how it is for the fallen children of Adam and Eve. Sin brought death, which was not God's plan not God's desire. I think our culture loves death so much because it's given up on life. It's given up on life because it has never known real life, true life, life under the cross. Abundant, overflowing, peaceful, everlasting life can only be experienced by those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ and know what he has done and what he promises. The Savior died on the cross and rose again in victory. Apart from Christ and his cross, life is nothing more than empty days filled with meaningless events moving endlessly toward its termination. Apart from Christ and his cross, life is lived just for yourself. Apart from Christ and the cross, power, success, size, pleasure, those things become our goals and we tell ourselves, live for these things because you have nothing else to live for. And without those things, life isn't worth living. That's the attitude of the world. 
how sad it is for those who think that's all there is. Life under the cross is different. And the text from Romans 12 lists three qualities of those who live life under the cross, a couple of which Gunter mentioned in his talk earlier already. Joyful in hope was the first one it mentioned. Hope. In normal conversation of people in the world, hope simply means wishful thinking. But that's not what the followers of Jesus mean when they say hope. You know, the world hopes for things because they're beyond their control. They'll say things like, well, I hope it doesn't rain again today. Or, I hope I win the lottery. You know, all that wishful thinking that people do. But the hope of a Christian is different. Hope for followers of Jesus is the confidence that God keeps his promises. To say we hope for heaven means we expect it. We know it's in our future because Jesus already earned it for us. The link between joy and hope is not coincidental. The joy of a Christian is not found in the changing circumstances of this world and this life. The joy of a Christian is found in the certain promises of God. God promises that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. That's our hope. Life under the cross knows that there is joy beyond sorrow. Life beyond death. And that hope, that confidence, makes it possible for us to rejoice even in the midst of overwhelming grief. For we Christians do not grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We have hope. Unlike the world, our joy is not dependent upon happy circumstances in this life. The advocates of euthanasia, abortion, assisted suicide, they always want to talk about the quality of life. You see, the world ties joy and happiness and purpose and meaning to certain criteria of physical and emotional and mental health. Doing so leads many to the conclusions that were drawn by Nazi Germany. And they came to the conclusion that some lives were not worth living. And that's why they extinguished so many. Christian joy, however, doesn't use that standard. It's tied to the certain hope that God, the creator of life, loves life and values every human life. Whether or not it has quality in the eyes of the world, God values every human life. We have hope in the certainty that as long as God gives life, God gives life purpose and meaning. Listen to that again. We have hope in the certainty that as long as God gives life, God gives life purpose and meaning. Christian joy is tied to the presence of this hope and not to the absence of pain and suffering. And that's the second point that our text makes. It's we should be patient in affliction. That is why this passage tells you that. The Bible is a realistic book. It knows that your life will not be one of ease. In this world, you will have trouble. It won't be a life free from pain where you rest comfortably on a bed of roses. Instead, Christ, who suffered for us, warns that all of us who follow him must take up our cross and follow him and endure the sufferings of this life. The theology of the cross enables us to view our afflictions in a positive sense, as a means of strengthening our faith and reliance upon God. Like Paul, we would certainly prefer to be relieved of our sufferings, of whatever thorn in the flesh we may have. We might ask God to take it away. But God's loving response to Paul applies equally to each of us. In 2 Corinthians 12, God said, My grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. 
Our trials here prepare us for eternity by driving us to the loving arms of God and reminding us of our absolute dependence upon his grace. And as we live under the cross, we are able to entrust our lives to his care, confident of his love. To live under the cross means that we live by faith, not by sight, trusting God's promises. That faith remains unshaken, even in the direst of circumstances, because the promise of Jesus is, as I said a moment ago, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Patience in affliction comes from living life under the cross. Patience in affliction is knowing that because of the cross, nothing can separate us from God's love. Patience in affliction comes from knowing that because of the cross, the victory has been won. And our affliction is but light and momentary compared to the glory that awaits us. And finally, life under the cross helps us to think about being faithful in prayer. We need to talk to God. We can do that. We can make our requests known to him. We can be open with him about our frustrations. We can talk to him about our afflictions and our sufferings. We can go to him confident that he is listening. You know, David was one who always went to God with anything and everything on his heart, and much of that is recorded for us in the book of Psalms, how he would go to God, and he would, he would get in God's face, and he'd say things like, why have you forsaken me? We know that God understands such prayers, and he listens. Jesus prayed a prayer just like that on the cross, didn't he? We can be faithful in prayer under the cross because the cross assures us that God is merciful and listening. Prayer should be a constant reality of a life lived under the cross. Unfortunately, all too often, we pray as a last resort when everything else has failed. But for the believer, living under the cross, prayer should be your starting point, how you begin each day. In prayer, you acknowledge your dependence upon God. Prayer is a trusting response to the promises that God has made to you, confident that he hears and answers. And when we pray, not my will, but thine be done, you're acknowledging God is in control. It's an act of submission. I think it's somewhat ironic that the cross, an instrument of execution and death, has become for the believers the symbol of life. The cross, God demonstrates that he values human life every human life because he sent Jesus to that, cro to that cross to die for the sins of the world. Everyone. Human life was worth so much that God would give up that which was most precious to him, the life of his son, for you and for me and for everyone. The cross contradicts every attempt to define the value of life in terms of size or health or age or quality or race. People may scorn, people in this world may scorn and reject as worthless the life of an old man or an old woman in a nursing home. People in the world will re scorn and reject the value of the life of the unborn, the life of the terminally ill, the life of someone physically or mentally handicapped. But the cross demonstrates God's love for each and every one of those people. In fact, it is people like these in their weakness, in their vulnerability and their pain, where we can most clearly see the nature of God's gracious love. Life under the cross is radically different from the life the world would have us live. It's a life of sacrifice. It's a life of putting the needs of others ahead of your own. It's a life of joyful hope, even in the midst of pain and suffering.
It's a life of patient endurance in affliction because you know God's love is at work even in your suffering. It's a life of faithful prayer because we know we have a merciful and understanding God. Life under the cross, no matter what the circumstances, is a life worth living, a life God has given. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And may the peace of God that passes understanding keep your hearts and minds in the true faith through life everlasting. Amen. We rise for prayer. In our prayers today, we remember, in addition to those listed in the bulletin, Barb Meyer, who was hospitalized this week with a bacterial infection. She is back home now. And also remember Ellie Schmidt, who has been diagnosed, uh, tested positive for COVID. Let us pray. Oh Lord, blessed be your name forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, we praise you. You're high above everything else, and your glory fills all things. Whenever we look to the skies, we see the glories of heaven. We see the imprint of your almighty hand. And the revelation of your glory and majesty makes us realize just how insignificant we sinful mortals really are. We wonder along with the psalmist, what is man, that you are mindful of him. And yet you did visit us. You came down to us in the person of Jesus Christ to rescue us so that we could have life and have it to the full. For this we give you our humble and hearty thanks. Lord, in your mercy. Words will always fail us as we try to express our praise to you. The good tidings that you will forgive and forget our sins when we come to you in your son's name is such sweet music to our ears. We confess that we have often mourned when we should have rejoiced. Forgive us, Lord, and accept our thanks for sending your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. He has bound up the brokenhearted, freed us from the slavery to sin, given us the oil of gladness and a mantle of praise. He cares for those who the world sees as having no value. His love extends to all. In gratitude, may for all that mercy, may we be your feet to carry that message of love and mercy and salvation to others. Your hands to help those who are in need. Your mouth to speak the good news. We pray that your compassion and mercy and healing touch would be extended to those in need. We pray today for Marie, for Jean, for Irvin and Marilyn, for Chuck and Gail, for Noel, for Tom, for Ben, for Ellie, for Barb. We ask that you would be with all the people who are first responders and medical workers who are oftentimes overwhelmed with their jobs. We pray that your peace would be known in this area and in our lives. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for which we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. You may be seated.
Jesus in worship. We do have a couple of announcements that need to be made, so we're going to let them come on up right now and do that. Good morning. I am sure you've all noted in your bulletins by now and also on the screens up here that two weeks from yesterday is the Fishers of Man rummage sale. And as they say in football, it is huge. <laughs> so I want to give you just a little bit of information about that because it is so huge and we've had such beautiful donations and many donations. We are going to need a lot of help. And so I'm asking those of you that feel that you'd be able to work the day of the sale to look at the door of the kitchen in the back. And there are some slots that need to be filled in of jobs that are available that day of the sale. We also have a list up there for people that might be able to bring a, a pot of chili and uh, you can sign your name on that list if you're able to do that. We are also going to have a bake sale. You do not have to sign up for the bake sale. If you're able to bake cookies or bars or pies or bread or whatever you'd like to, uh, you can bring that the day before the sale, which would be February 4th. And we'd like it here on Friday because we are going to be marking and packaging. Then, during the week starting on Monday, January 31st through Friday, the day before the sale, and we will be here at the church from 9.30 to 3. We will be sorting, pricing, packaging, and if anybody is willing or able to come on any of those days at any time, we'd love to see you because we will need help going through all these things. You do not have to sign up for that either. So, hopefully we will see many of you that week and also many of you at the sale for a lot of food, fun, and fellowship. Okay, good morning. Before the rummage sale, next weekend we're having a party in case you haven't heard. We're having a banquet and we're kicking off our fundraiser. Want you all to come. We got some great entertainment and music and a great, fabulous meal. But in order to have that great, fabulous meal and have a room set up big enough with enough tables and chairs and enough food to feed you all, we need to know about it. I need your reservations in as today, really. Please fill out your cards and make sure you leave in the basket by the door or hand them to me, and I hope to see you all there. It's 5.30 is open the doors, and 6 o'clock we'll be starting the program. See you there. Good morning. I'm the last one, I promise. <laughs> In preparation for our meeting on Sunday, as we look toward our time together and our fundraiser, we have been in prayer for the last three weeks. And again this morning, you have an insert in your bulletin with a, a short guide for how you can pray this week. On Thursday, we are, have set aside and designated as our day of prayer. I know. 30 minutes seems like a really long time to come pray. I remember the first time I signed up for a prayer vigil. It was a 24-hour thing, and I have no idea why I did this. I signed up for 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and I remember a family in our church had opened their home. I remember walking in and thinking, oh, how nice this is. The next thing I remember is someone shaking my shoulder, waking me. <laughs> I did not do very well at my first prayer vigil. Hopefully you'll do better. <laughs> but you know the things I have learned along the way, God is our friend 
and we can talk to him just like talking to a friend. I'm sure all of you have at some point in the last couple of weeks spoken with a friend or a family member about our meeting on Sunday. Well, now it's time for us to speak to God, our friend, about that meeting. Martin Luther said, I have much to do, much to accomplish today, so I will spend the first three hours in prayer. This week, please come on Thursday and spend 30 minutes in prayer.